I think one of the coolest and most underestimated methods in qualitative analysis is analytic induction. Analytic induction is very old, already based on the work of John Stuart Mill, but described by Florian Zdaniecki in the 1930s in his the method of sociology. And this analytic induction hasn't been used a lot, but it has been used in the Chicago School of Sociology. And currently, there has been a revival of analytic induction in the form of qualitative comparative analysis as Charles Reagan developed. So it is still an important method. Now, what is this analytic induction? Analytic induction is not simple, naive induction. No, it's a smart way of doing induction. So what steps do you take in analytic induction? First, you specify the outcome or the phenomenon you are going to research. And sometimes this is based on induction, but sometimes you define it beforehand. So it doesn't really matter where it comes from. And then, well, then you collect data on a small number of cases with that specific outcome. So you have some dependent variable and you look for cases with that dependent variable. And then you start to identify commonalities between these different cases and you try to formulate a hypothesis, a starting point for your theory about this phenomenon, about this outcome. What is happening? What is causing this outcome? How can we see some process going on? When you did that, you start to collect more data, more cases, you look at more cases, and then you look very specifically for deviant cases. You hope you stumble upon a deviant case. Why? Because this deviant case will help you, will teach you a lot. So unlike naive induction, where deviant cases are the worst nightmare, in analytic induction, you want to get deviant cases in order to do either one of these two things. First, you can redefine the outcome or the phenomenon. Wait a second, this case is deviant. Does it mean that we have to redefine what is going on? Probably, yes. Or you have to redefine your hypothesis. So either your dependent variable or your explanation. And after that, you look for more cases, more deviant cases, hopefully, and if not, afterwards, you start looking for new cases again, hopefully deviant cases, but if not, it doesn't really matter because after a while, when you only find new cases that fit within your theory, fit within your hypothesis, then maybe your hypothesis is right. One of the school book examples of analytic induction is the work by Charles Lindesmith. He looked at the question, why do people become addicted to opiate drugs? And before Lindesmith, there were all kinds of different explanations, such as, oh, these people, they're just antisocial. They're junkies. They've had a bad childhood or uh, something's wrong in their brain. But Lindesmith went to interview drug addicts. He went to interview them and he saw that housewives that were functioning perfectly in society were addicted as well. So he thought, well, addiction is not only to do with your background or your antisocial behavior. It's more of a process. So what is needed then? What is the outcome? Addiction. And what is necessary to become addicted? Why do people get addicted? Well, because it's a process and it starts with using a certain amount of drugs for a certain amount of time. And then for one reason or the other, your prescription stops, you can't get any drugs anymore, you quit for a, maybe a short period of time, maybe a longer period of time. But because you quit with opiate drugs, you get all kinds of symptoms. And these symptoms are withdrawal symptoms. And if you just quit, you have these symptoms and then that's it. Well, that's it. You're not addicted. But if you interpret these symptoms as effects of withdrawal, as effect or effects of not using the drugs, and you interpret it that way, you're a step closer to addiction because probably 
or maybe you will use these drugs again. And if you start using the drugs as routine because otherwise you get these symptoms, then you're addicted. Now this work was revolutionary, really revolutionary. Why? Well, using analytic induction, going back and forth between cases, the hypothesis, changing the hypothesis because of the housewife he interviewed, he came to a totally new way of looking at addiction. A second example of analytic induction is the study by Howard Becker on marijuana. Inspired by Linda Smith, Becker want, wanted to look at how do marijuana users deal with this? Because he perceived that marijuana users did not have a withdrawal effect. So he didn't see them as addicts because they could stop and then stop for a longer period of time. Whereas opiate drug users, they couldn't and they become addicts. So Becker posed a slightly different question. question why do jazz musicians use marijuana? And he says, well, in the end, there are two reasons. The first is because they learn it. So the, we have the outcome. Why do they use marijuana? Why have they become marijuana users? Well, because they learned it. It's a necessary condition. And second, another necessary condition, because they deal with the social deviant aspect. Because people in their surrounding probably didn't like it and they had to deal with that. So how does this research go about? How does he use analytic induction? Well, he talks with jazz musicians. He speaks with them. He plays, uh, he played uh, music with them. And he saw that they learned how to smoke. People told him that they had to learn how to inhale. They had to learn how to how much air you have to breathe in, how long to take it in order to have some effects. So they had to learn how to smoke it. And then second, they had to learn how to perceive the effects. Is this what I'm feeling because of the drugs I use or is it just because I'm tired or something else? So they had to learn what effects were marijuana effects. And then the third step, they had to learn to enjoy these effects because getting dizzy might be not the nicest way to feel. But for marijuana users, it is, because that's part of being high and getting high. Well, how did Becker know this? Because also of deviant cases. He looked at cases and he found many convincing cases, many people talking about how they learn to smoke, many people talking about how they learn to perceive the effects. Many people that talked about how to learn to enjoy the effects. But he also came across people that learned how to uh, smoke, but didn't learn this and didn't learn this. So that told him something. These are not real marijuana users. And then there's a second process in this work. And the second process is that marijuana users have to find justification to deal with the deviant aspect because it's illegal or it used to be illegal um, and it used to be pretty deviant behavior and, and possibly damaging. So they had to come up with all kinds of justifications. And these were also learned, which means that there have been teachers. So Becker says becoming a marijuana user is a social thing. It's not, you don't become a marijuana user on your own, you become it in a group. Every, behind every marijuana user, there's another user. And these other users teach you how to learn to smoke, teach you how to smoke. They teach you how to perceive the effect. They teach you how to enjoy the effects and they teach you all kinds of justifications. So remember the lecture in the first week about falsification. We spoke about Karl Popper who said that if you have a theory that all swans are white and you come across a single black swan, then it shows that your theory was wrong. Well, in analytic induction, this black swan shows you that your theory is not complete yet. So what you try to do is you try to incorporate deviant cases, new elements into your theory. So you can say something about swans in general. 
And that's what you try to do in analytic induction. Incorporate all cases until your theory fits.